Um, but I'll just tell you about her anyway. Um, she was a sixth term congresswoman from Georgia, um, representing the Atlanta, Decatur area in the House of Representatives. Um, very strong fighter um, for, you know, the economic, you know, social well-being of her constituents. But also, as we've seen since she was, since she's been out of Congress, um, that was not her choice, of course. But um, since she's been out of Congress, we've really seen the full breadth of the the amazing spirit, the amazing work that she does. And um, I dare say she's one of the, you know, you know, in this age, you know, we're, you know, my generation, Generation X, Generation Y, um, you know, we're real cynical about people in power, especially people in Congress and the federal government, but, you know, I, I dare say this is one of the, you know, this, this sister's one of the great humanitarians of our time, you know. I, I didn't think I would, you know, in, in our age would ever see this type, do they make people like this anymore? So, um, no further ado, I'd like to welcome former Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney. I would also like to say a special word of thanks to St. Joseph's AME Church for allowing us to come here. And I would hasten to add that none of the ideas of the speakers is the idea of St. Joseph's AME Church. We do not speak for the church, we speak for ourselves. And the, I enjoy sitting and listening to Brother Akbar spin the yarns of the times that he visited Libya and of the people that he met. Because many of those names that he can call, that he knows, that he has met with, that he has sat in meetings with, are the names that are in the news today. And the history that Brother Akbar can spin of his own personal relationship with Libya is a story that I have seen replicated in meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting. After meeting. And the reason is because the government of Libya, through the leadership of Muammar Gaddafi, reached out to people. That leadership reached out to Africans on the continent who were fighting apartheid and colonialism. That leadership reached out to black people in the United States who were fighting oppression and repression. That leadership reached out to people in Northern Ireland who were fighting apartheid over there and we have had people at every one of these meetings come and give their testimonial of their own personal relationship with Libya. And so when Johnny says that the war against Libya is a war against Africa. He speaks not only of the fact that Libya is located in Africa, but also of the open borders that Libya had in inviting all of Africa come and help Libya rebuild because they didn't have a problem with finance because they had a lot of oil and a lot of gold, 144 tons of gold. And I guarantee you that somebody is looking for that gold. They want the oil, they want the gold, they want the water that's underneath the desert that Muammar Gaddafi and the people of Libya along with the scientists and the technological know-how from China, were able to locate. So, when Brother Akbar and I 
were in Libya together, which was January, February, we were there because Muammar Gaddafi and the people of Libya had decided that if Africans, a people of African descent, could not live in dignity in Europe or in the Western Hemisphere, that they could come back to Africa and live in dignity in Libya and help Libya rebuild. That was the purpose of the conference. And so we left there, and my passport is stamped by the Department of Homeland Security February 17th. And now, somewhere between the tranquility of Tripoli that Brother Akbar and I witnessed, there was supposed to be, according to Haaretz and Al Jazeera, the government of Libya turning helicopter gunships on its people inside Libya, firing upon them and killing them. That's what the media reported. But we had just come from Tripoli. And there was no way that in the spirit of that conference, I could believe what I was being asked to believe by our media. And with a little background, a little background is something that Brother Akbar alluded to. It was that under the Bush administration, we were led into a war against the people of Iraq. And our government didn't tell us the truth. But not only did the government not tell us the truth, the media didn't tell us the truth either. And according to some estimates, FAIR.org, one of them, 935 times our government failed to tell us the truth. They told us that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. And that Saddam Hussein was only minutes away from being able to launch a weapon against the United States. That he was preparing nuclear weapons. I mean, the gamut of information that was available went from all of the extremes, but in the end, it wasn't true. There were some people who told us that it wasn't true. These were insiders at the United Nations, for example. Dennis Halliday, Scott Ritter, people who had been to Iraq. And they did their own investigation. They were employed by the United Nations. Their job was to understand just exactly what kind of weapons program there was. And they said, no, this is not true. But the media continued to pump the American people so that the administration could get the war that they wanted. Now, I just happened to have also had the opportunity, because I was interested in the counterintelligence program, to read a document called Operation Northwoods. And I don't know if you're familiar with Operation Northwoods. Anybody in here familiar with Operation Northwoods? One, two, Two people. Operation Northwoods, three people. Operation Northwoods was brought to me by, the, the papers were brought to me by the author of, uh, now I can't remember his name, the book, but the Puzzle Palace was one of his books. And here are our leaders in the Pentagon. And they want to have a war against Castro's Cuba. But the people of the United States don't support a war against Castro's Cuba for nothing. Castro's Cuba has got to do something to the people of the United States in order to justify the war.
more than the people in the Pentagon want. So they sit around the table and they throw out ideas about things that could happen in order to justify a war against Cuba. One of those things was that they could hijack planes. Another one of those things was that, well, in order to outrage the American people, we need to make sure that university students are on that plane. It needs to happen during summer break so that the people can really increase, intensify their outrage when the planes are shot down. They even talked about bringing terror to the streets of Miami. Now this is our Pentagon, our Department of Defense, talking about killing American people so that they could blame it on Castro's Cuba and then justify the war. That is Operation Northwoods. Now you can look it up and you can see the original U.S. government documents. It's not a secret for anybody who wants to read it. The COINTELPRO papers are not a secret for anyone who wants to read it. If you care about how indigenous people in this country are treated, then read what our own government did to them as they tried to defend their rights on this land. If you care about how black people are treated now, read about how our own government acted. They set up in nice, fancy government suites and they concocted ideas, even cartoons, about how they could destroy the marriages of individuals who were leading the civil rights movement. That was fun for them. They sat up and they figured out what the weaknesses were of individual men and women so that they could fly on those weaknesses and destroy the movement of African Americans for dignity in this country. And if you think that white people are immune to this kind of manipulation, read those call and tell pro papers. There was an actress who was supported of the Black Panthers, the aim, the mission, the agenda of the Black Panther Party members. And because she was sympathetic, the FBI decided that they were going to start a rumor that she was pregnant by one of the members of the Black Panther Party. Of course, she was shamed. She was so shamed and so intimidated that she committed suicide. One of the aspects of these co papers is that they don't want blacks, Chicanos, Latinos, Puerto Rican independentistas, whites. They don't want us to come together. And they openly talked about creating the walls of division so that we would think that our separate agenda is more valid than the other person's separate agenda, and those agendas would remain separated, never the twain to be mixed. But of course, we know that if we're like this, but if we're like this, okay? So, we are in Libya, and all of a sudden, the media has it everywhere around the world that there's war and that Gaddafi and the government are fighting their own, killing their own people. But there's another important piece 
to this puzzle. And that is that we also have to understand that the media lying to us is nothing new. If you read the transcript of the 1999 trial where the jury in Memphis, Tennessee in 1999 found that the U.S. government was complicit in the conspiracy to murder Dr. King. That transcript is available on the internet at thekingcenter.org. So we don't have any excuse for not knowing because the information is there for us to know. And then we can apply critical analysis and draw the correct conclusions. Well, anyway, one of the expert witnesses testified that approximately 30% of the CIA budget was spent on the mighty Wurlitzer. That's what they called it at the time. That is public opinion. Hmm. Creating public opinion. They wanted to make sure that they played the right music so that the American people would do the right dance. The mighty Wurlitzer. If 30% of the CIA's budget in 1999 was spent on shaping public opinion, how much do you think is spent now? It's even more. And our Department of Defense even has a Department of Perception Management. This is all available. I'm not saying anything that is not factual. And so we shouldn't be surprised when we read in our local newspaper that psychological operations agents of the CIA are active, and DIA for that matter, are active inside, for example, CNN, which was the headline in my local newspaper. So that coupled with a 2005 decision by a Florida court saying that the U.S. media did not have a responsibility to tell the American people the truth, i.e. that the U.S. media could knowingly lie and not suffer any criminal responsibility for knowingly misleading us. You can look that up too. That was a Project Censored story. I don't know if you're familiar with Project Censored, but every day, they, I mean, every year they put out a publication of the top most censored stories. And that was one of those stories. So now knowing all of that, and after having just come from Tripoli, what else could I have concluded except that somehow, somewhere, somebody wasn't telling the truth? And so what I decided to do was to put a delegation together of alternative journalists to go to Libya and then do what alternative journalists do. When we made our way, actually we had to fly into Tunis and then uh, fly into the Tunisian island of Cherba and then you drive for six hours to get into Tripoli, but we had uh, camera people, so they started videotaping. And much of what you've seen coming from Libya actually was taken by those journalists. I invited Wayne Madsen, an investigative journalist, his stories are on WayneMadsonReport.com and uh, Wayne began to write stories. And immediately when we reached Tripoli, we saw life as normal. We saw life as normal except that 
all of the migrant workers had left because they had been told, you know, that they were going to leave and they were living in refugee camps on the Tunisian border. And the ironic thing is that one of those refugee camps is financed by United Arab Emirates and they have joined in the coalition to help with the bombing. So anyway, we know that from our visit there with an entire delegation of people from the United States, and then we had one journalist also from um, South Africa who uses that satellite that Colonel Gaddafi and the people of Libya financed for all of Africa. And so he um, owns Channel 4, which beams its stories throughout Southern Africa. We know that the story that the American people have been, uh, that the people all over the world, quite frankly, have been told is not true. We were able to document that. And I have to be honest with you in my remaining one minute, that when I left the United States, headed on this truth-seeking mission, I was, well, I wasn't afraid, but I was concerned about whether or not I'd be allowed back into my own country. I've had problems in the past getting back into my own country. But we started putting stories out from the moment that we landed. And there was one story that I put out when NATO announced that they were intensifying the bombing. And that story, I called it Feast of Blood. In 48 hours, it got a million and a half hits. It went everywhere. And at that point, it also went to some of my former colleagues. And at that point, then questions began to be asked not just among the American people, but in the halls of Congress.